Uh, if we miss your question uh, with such a large group, we'll try to come back to you. There'll be a Q&A session at the end. But today's topic is about the, the super uh, cool, super innovative uh, um, uh, high flex classroom, the hybrid flexible classroom model that's all the craze these days uh, due to the changing uh, circumstances of uh, teaching these days. So we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot about the hybrid uh, the hybrid flexible classroom model, uh, as well as uh, I'm gonna review the four most common teaching environments to kind of set that up. And we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of each of those uh, to show you what the difference is, and then I'm actually gonna dive into a few details about what the model is and what it isn't, and how you might actually do it yourself if you're not already. And then we'll talk about um, uh, just some basic course design uh, principles that no matter if you're considering uh, the hybrid, the high flex model, the, these real basic things might help you uh, in a pinch uh, given the circumstances. All right, so if you're all ready and at the ready on chat, feel free to, to interject uh, via the chat. And if you have a question about what we're talking about on the slide, feel free to, to chime in. Uh, definitely wanna hear from you. Uh, you can come off mute. And of course you have your awesome, handy, uh, nonverbal uh, options through Zoom. Feel free to use those too. Uh, I always love uh, the coffee, uh, steaming coffee and the thumbs up uh, and the round of applause. That keeps me going, uh, that keeps me going here. So uh, without further ado, let's jump in and let's have a fun conversation about the model. But before we do that, uh, I wanna play a game. Uh, you guys with me? Let's play a game. <laughs> uh, let's play Mythbusters. All right, love it. Give the thumbs up. Uh, I, I feel like a game show host here. Let's play Mythbusters, the educator's edition. All right. Uh, I'm curious to know what are some common myths about teaching that uh, maybe they're a myth, maybe they're not. Let's find out. I have some. Uh, maybe in the chat you want to put some myths that are on your mind. Uh, some things uh, that you're like, hey, uh, is this a thing or not? Let's talk about it. But I have a few and uh, I'll cover them. Feel free to weigh in. Uh, the options are uh, busted or confirmed or plausible, right? Those are the options for those of you who watch that show, Mythbusters. Uh, no longer on, but it's a great show. All right, so the first one, are you ready? All right, so the first uh, consideration is about true false questions. So are true false questions an effective way to measure learning? What do you guys think? Busted, confirmed, plausible. What do y'all think? I know some of you out there are using multiple choice in this pandemic, uh, uh, teaching, uh, using exams, doing all that stuff online. What do y'all think? Yeah, look at that. This was awesome. I, my, my chat just blew up. That's awesome. That is awesome. All right. Some great comments here. All right. Flip classroom. Awesome. So uh, without, so we got some busted. Uh, we got some plausible. Okay. We got false. Okay. Well, uh, the science is in, uh, the verdict is in that true false questions have not been able to show any learning uh, improvements uh, or worse yet, there's no connection to what people actually know and how they answer true false questions. All right. So uh, I know it's super easy to grade and it's hard to get away from it. At the same time, you're just basically creating busy work for your students by asking true false questions. All right. Maybe there's a better way to ask and answer the question that you really want to know that measures what they know. All right. Awesome. Uh, I love this. Uh, my, my chat is absolutely going insane. Uh, that's a good sign. I love it. Thank you. All right. So let's keep it going. We'll go to the next one here. Uh, I'll for sure share all that stuff with you. If you Google it, it will come right up. <laughs> it, it's not hard to find for sure. But yeah, uh, email me and I'll be sure to give you all the references. Some great, uh, uh, some great uh, um, references on this idea. Uh, the Mythbusters is the citation. They did it. That you don't. All right, the next one. So uh, if you're not familiar with multiple intelligences, uh, Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence proposes 
that people are not born with all their intelligences they will ever have, that this is something that's developed over time as they uh, grow and mature. Uh, specifically uh, related to learning, there's this concept called pluralization of information and how you teach, that you as teachers should try to uh, triangulate multiple intelligences in different ways for individual students. All right, that's a mouthful for sure. If you're not familiar with it, maybe uh, you don't have a strong uh, uh, vote on this, but is this theory uh, busted or is it confirmed or is it plausible? Uh, U UDL is another one. Uh, I'm glad that one came up too. Uh, I recently read a study that actually that one, there's no evidence that suggests UDL is a thing. Uh, there's no evidence like 16,000 uh, uh, citations uh, articles, meta-analysis that showed that there's no uh, uh, evidence of that. But getting back to multiple intelligences, we say we got some confirmed, we have some uh, plausible, uh, all these things. Okay, well, it's busted. Multiple intelligence does not exist. <laughs> and here's why. There's no citation. The author says so. <laughs> Howard has come along, and if you go to his website, he will say that this was just a theory that he decided to make up. Uh, although he had the best ambitions in the beginning, that there's no evidence that we have multiple intelligences. We do have different talents, and we have a uh, different skill set, but our prior knowledge is informed by a multitude of factors in our environment, as well as nature. So to pinpoint to say you're born a certain way, and that then you plug in the formula, and then all of a sudden you get the final answer uh, that probably all our neuro folks probably know uh, who study that type of stuff probably know that that probably isn't uh, all the way scientific based. Uh, at the same time, um, I think that there's better explanations for why you might want to teach clinical reasoning skills and how you would do that. Sure, triangulation of different ways to do it, but at the same time, uh, maybe we think about team-based learning, case-based learning, some of these other theories that have actual evidence that support the decisions that you make as a teacher to offer that to your students. All right, I promise they're not all busted here. All right, so here comes another one. Lecturing, this is controversial. Oops, I went too far. Let's go back, I gave it away. Lecturing does not lead to significant learning. Is that confirmed? Is it busted or is it plausible? All right. You guys saw the answer, I love it. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, without further ado. So a lot of folks have a bad, uh, uh, a bad connotation about lecturing. Uh, and I, I admit like, I thought I was super cool uh, when I became a teacher, I was like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lecture, no, no PowerPoint. And then I wanted to do everything active. And I absolutely wore myself out and I absolutely wore my students out. Uh, not everything needs to be active learning. Not everything needs to have a song and dance and a, a you know, a band come through uh, the classroom. Uh, sometimes it is okay to just give the information and that is equally as effective. Uh, a lot of folks have tried to uh, say that lecturing is less than as a teaching method. Um, I think mostly the motivation behind that is to try to do something different, to be novel. There is some value in teaching in a different way. Uh, it might not be the best way, but students lean into it because it's different and fresh, which is kind of related to why you all are here today and what we're talking about. Uh, uh, we don't fully always know what the learning outcomes are gonna be, but in some cases, don't be afraid of lecturing. I would say good instruction is good instruction. If you can do lectures well, maybe you don't need to bring the band in. You don't need a full on parade to get your point across on the information you're trying to teach. Okay. Yeah, uh, Kelly, uh, I totally agree. Like there's, it's controversial. And like I said, I, I think it's all about how it's done. We've all had, you know, the Charlie Brown uh, teacher, right? Where we tune out. Um, no one here, of course, uh, in that same category, but, you know, it's easy to tune them out because that's all they do is talk on the slides. Uh, their slides are too busy. The slides don't match the assessment. Uh, all of those other issues that probably deteriorate the quality of the lecture. But at the same time, if you do the lecture well, it's connected to your objectives. Students uh, um, are getting a lot of value from it. It's, it you can be engaging. 
uh, all those things, I wouldn't shy away from lecturing for sure. All right, next one, just a few here remaining. Online learning. Here's another controversial statement. In person, in person versus online. Uh, a lot of people have argued that online is less than. What do y'all think? Is that true? Is that a myth? Online is less than in person? Or has it been confirmed? Or is it plausible? All right, confirm, busted, learn as much. Yep, good point, uh, Dr. Bennett, for sure. Myth, okay, all right, false, all right. Well, this is, uh, I think this is a mixed bag. I think the answer is kind of a mixed bag. Uh, until now, up until the pandemic, I would say that the, the majority of the literature suggests that in-person uh, is better than online. Um, my personal feelings, and this is just my personal opinion, I feel like there has been not the need, uh, in-person has been done more, so maybe we say we're just better at it because we do it more. That could be part of the explanation. Two is the technology isn't where it is today. Uh, due to the pandemic, here we are, and we have some amazing tools with a lot of stability. The internet has never been more reliable in human history than it is today. Um, so all of these things might be offering the opportunity for online learning to catch up, right? So. I don't know the answer to this. I think you all are all right, uh, whether it comes to online or per in person. But what I would say is it has a purpose and it has a lot of value for us. Uh, now's the time where we will see the ripple effect that now that we're teaching almost exclusively online, at least for a short term, what comes out of this? What are the implications a year from now? What are the implications five years from now? What are the implications a lifetime from now? This is what I'm excited about to learn about this idea of online learning. All right, here we go. All right, just uh, two more. All right, students are either auditory, visual, or kinesthetic learners. Busted, plausible, or confirmed? Hello. Uh, Al, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, uh, uh, preferences are not exclusive. Uh, yeah, I I'm so glad to see this. Uh, keep, keep going, keep chiming in. Yeah, uh, uh, this is a, a um, totally busted. So, and, and this is how I put it in terms that I can comprehend is, uh, when, I, when I learn and when I've ever learned, um, I would say that there are predominant senses that we use as humans. A lot of our lectures, a lot of our course uh, activities are based on sight and sound, uh, uh, for sure. A little bit of writing, which could be connected to the kinesthetic. And then, of course, we have lab-based classes that are kinesthetic, so on and so forth. And then there's other theories. You know, of course, we have taste and smell and then uh, embodied cognition, meaning how our brain is connected to our body, physical movement. Um, but never ever would I say that I've only learned something through my ears. Uh, if you think about it, that's probably not reasonable, right? That's not what's happening. We might only be focusing on that. For what it's worth, we might be listening to a book on tape. So that's all that's available to us while we're learning. So instead, I think there's some better explanations out there for us that would explain how people learn. Um, if you remember way, way, way back when, in February, we did a session on collaboration and we talked about this instrument that uh, identified learning preferences, how humans consume information and how that can lead to how we learn that then can inform how we collaborate ultimately. That's called the Let Me Learn Learning Connections Inventory. Most of you uh, see some familiar faces here, some familiar names. A lot of you took that instrument and we had some great discussions back in February and March about that. Um, let me know if you need to know more about it. We'll post the link here in the chat, uh, how, to, how to, to read up more on that. And there are others out there, but when it comes to learning, uh, I think it might be a better way to help understand our learners, our students. All right. Awesome. All right. One more. Yeah, absolutely. Some great points here for sure. Yep, absolutely. And it's funny how I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that up again about the difficulty of learning online. All right, so last myth busters uh, round here. Let's see who can get this right. Uh, the high flex teaching approach is difficult to implement in your class. Uh, 
What do y'all think about that? So some of you may never have heard this term before and just decided to come hang out with us for whatever reason. I wish I could offer you coffee uh, uh, as an uh, incentive. But in the meantime, uh, some of you know what it is and some of you are curious to learn more about it. What do you think? What do you think? Uh, here's a new innovative teaching uh, approach. Uh, can you do it in your own class? Hope it's, it's going to be true. Okay. I mean, it's, <laughs> you hope it's not difficult. Yeah, plausible. Okay. Uh, Anna says that. So the, the jury's out, uh, I would say. Let's talk about it. Uh, this should segue into our conversation about it more. And maybe at the end, you'll tell me if it's plausible, confirmed, or busted. All right. All right. Here we go. Feel free to, to, to put your questions in um, the chat. And thank you for, for humoring me. Hopefully that was fun to talk about some of these, these myths related to teaching. All right, so the hybrid model. I'm gonna, I'm gonna set this up, but uh, before I get into the nitty gritty of what the hybrid, uh, the high flex, excuse me, the high flex model is, but what I really want to impress upon you at this day and age is uh, it might be a viable solution for you, given your current circumstances of how you're teaching your classes, we don't know that. I don't know that fully. I'm going to give you some information to help you make that decision. But more importantly, I think this is an opportunity to be innovative. Um, the high flex model, uh, I, I could not find who yet has was the first person to use that term. But to me, it was like, boom, it really, uh, it really resonated with me different than other uh, teaching approaches. And uh, I was really curious to learn more about this. And there are some different schools, and in fact, med schools that are, are using this approach as a, as a school, as a department. And uh, the, the, the feedback in the, the actual application, it's still, the information is still rolling in. There's still some things that need to be worked out. But I think we're starting to get a clear sense of how, when, and why to use it, uh, which I'll cover here in a few slides. All right. So the reason why I, I wanted to talk to you all about it, especially this semester, um, is because I think it's going to give you some flexibility. I think it's a possibility for you to innovate on what you're currently doing in a way that's going to lead to uh, real significant learning in your classes. Um, we have the challenge of being in person. We have the challenges of being in the lab. But some of us have the challenge of being in the clinic. I think this could apply to all of us depending on uh, how you want to adapt it. All right. So here we go. Before we cover uh, the high flex model, Let's talk about the four basic models before that that we're used to. Number one, good old teaching in person, right? This is probably what we said earlier, what we're most accustomed to doing. It's probably the most popular version. It's been around for, for centuries, right? Uh, uh, we're familiar with it. Um, it provides uh, dedicated time for both the instructor and the student. It protects our time. And then uh, I think one of the, the, the advantages, at least now that we're missing, is that nonverbal communication, right? We, we, we we're able to see when our students are getting things. They're able to see us when we get excited or not excited about something, right? That isn't necessarily attached to a word. It's more a feeling. And that helps with the learning process. We definitely know that. Um, people are more likely to feel a part of the community. They feel connected not only to you as the teacher, but from teacher to teacher, if you have lab assistants, those type of things, and then you create a community, third year, uh, you know, dentistry, uh, those students kind of now, um, we're, you know, we're the allied help, we're the OT department, and we're all together, and we're in that suit. It helps create that connection between uh, groups of people, and we know that when people feel a belonging to something, they're more likely to go with uh, um, and work hard to be a part of that group. Uh, but there are issues, there are limitations with teaching in person. Not that I need to explain this to you all, but you know, you got to get there. Uh, some of us have commutes and um, you're limited to what's in the room. Uh, we have some amazing facilities here at ATSU, some awesome equipment. The labs are well equipped for sure, but at the same time, uh, that's what you have. And sometimes you know that you're like, ah, I wish I had this and that would help. Or I wish I was in that classroom because that classroom has X. Uh, you're limited to what's in that classroom and you have to be aware of that going into the class. And I would argue time, right? The time constraint, uh, oftentimes you want to cover so much more than just whatever's allowed, uh, allotted an hour, four hours, a full day. You wish you had more time, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
All right, so then the, the other approach, and most of us are really only used to these two, is you got in person, and the flip is that is out of person. No, it's called online, right? We use technology to facilitate our instruction online. We have a whole school dedicated to this. And um, this is, you know, uh, not to be confused. Uh, there's online, there's distance learning, there's synchronous, there's asynchronous. Uh, I'm not going to make that distinction here today. The idea is that you're learning without being all in the same room, essentially, is what I'm getting at, all right? Uh, this is a super flexible way to try to facilitate your courses. Um, that's awesome, uh, for sure. Uh, but it requires a lot of self-discipline from the student's perspective to do well in an online learning environment. Uh, that's back to what Hal's comment was, is, you know, I prefer in person. It holds me accountable. I, I can see what's going on in the room. I know that I have to block out my time. I leave there. I come up with a system. I do my homework. I turn it in. Those type of things are all uh, the thing, considerations that you have to be mindful of in an online teaching environment. And then two is that you're not there as the teacher. So when you send something across the airways for students to do, uh, how do you know it lands, right? We don't know necessarily. Uh, sometimes we're missing those, those nonverbal cues again that lets us know that we're on the right path and that our students are getting what we're saying, whether it's homework, um, our message, uh, just feeling cared about, whatever that is. We have to build that in. We have to be more conscientious about making sure that students get that, right? Thumbs up if you get, if you're, if you're with me. All right, give me a thumbs up, there it is. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Jeremy, awesome. Yeah, so there's a, an example, right? A way of building in the, the nonverbal cues uh, to see if you're on the same page with me. Awesome. All right, so let's get into some different, maybe this is a little bit more, uh, less familiar to you, but maybe you've heard this term about hybrid. So the basic here is that it's, simply the combination of both in-person and online, but it will be exclusive. So each class session will be either online or it will be in-person. Uh, usually you don't mix the two. Uh, you might say, all right, this week we're, we're working on you know, this idea. You don't have to meet in person. We're just gonna check in over Zoom and we're gonna uh, talk about some things and do some homework together and answer any questions that you might have. Um, Super helpful, students love the flexibility, and it definitely helps us as instructors. We don't have to travel. It kind of offers the best of both worlds. It also offers the, the, the worst of both worlds when it comes to online and in-person teaching. Um, it could be the case um, where students don't anticipate you. Uh, if you don't have, uh, I've taken this class, uh, a class this way, where it was every other, the class was built every other, and so I'd, some days I'd forget, all right, am I supposed to be in person? or am I supposed to be online? I forget, you know, I'd have one, you know, I'd walk in the classroom with my computer, not knowing if there was gonna be anyone else in there. Um, that, that happened the few times that I took a hybrid course. That happened to me as an instructor where students were forgetting where they were supposed to be. Uh, you zig when they, when they zag uh, can be confusing and uh, less predictable, right? So however you decide to do that, you have to be real mindful of that, okay? And then uh, I'm going to move right along to flexible teaching. This might be one of the more uh, um, uh, unfamiliar uh, teaching formats where we uh, it's a combination of all of them in person, online, but basically flex teaching is where at the same time, one, any given class session, uh, you have students both in person and online. All right. And usually this is determined by the teacher. The teacher sends out a schedule and says, you know, group work is a big factor, determining factor. Group A, B, you're going to be online today. Group C and D, you guys are going to be in person because of what you're going to do. And we're going to kind of rotate. We're going to kind of rotate through the classes uh, to make that happen. Uh, but the teacher dictates, and they usually do it on, uh, for some purpose. Uh, uh, keep the class sizes smaller uh, to cover something that the other class, the other groups in the class don't need to know about. Um, and it doesn't have to be group work only. It could be individual, uh, however you want to do that. But it is, uh, it does offer flexibility. Some of the reasons for hybrid being so popular is because then students don't always have to commute. They might have a longer commute. Um, or maybe you want to hone in on something specific to a particular uh, group of students and then have them working at a certain cadence, pushing them along where they can get more attention based on where they are at in the learning process of your, your course. 
All right. So um, it takes some logistical uh, um, skill on your part as the teacher. Uh, you've got to be mindful of that. And then the other part that you need to be mindful of is how do you engage your students when they're all over the place, right? How do you, how do you engage your students when you're not even, you might not, depending, some of your classes are, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 90 plus, right? And you're maybe breaking them in half, but even still, it's hard to keep track of who's where in your class and then remembering where they are so that you can engage them, right? Now, are you focused on your, your, your students and knowing where they are, or are you focused on what you're trying to teach them? It can be distracting, right? So it definitely increases the cognitive load for both the student and the instructor trying to keep it straight. But there's a lot of positives here. It can keep the class, you know, you, you, you can keep your classes smaller. Um, you might be able to create connections, not at the big, the bigger level, but maybe in a smaller level. Groups A and B now become more of a team. Groups C and D become a team. All right. A any questions on that? I'll, I'll pause here to see if there's any questions about flexible teaching. Feel free to come off of mute and or uh, post them in the, the chat and I'll, I'll try to address them for you. Quincy, we have one question. Um, one person asked, do you need two people to facilitate flexible teaching? That's a good question. Um, I don't think so. I don't think it's a requirement. And I'm going to talk about that in the later slides before I wrap up about strategically how you can make that come to be. Uh, my, my suggestion is build your course one way. And what I would say, build it for the online format, build it that way with the idea that you're going to enhance your, your instruction by also having it in person. So the in-person part is the bonus. Build your course bulletproof for online and then offer the in-person and online, uh, make those assignments. And I think it will reduce the need to have multiple instructors helping you keep track of that. Um, a lot of you don't have that option. Uh, I know I would take it if somebody said, hey, Quincy, you could teach this class in a flexible model uh, and I'll give you help. Sure, that would easily be helpful. But I would say I think it, it can be done without punishment uh, if you think about it in terms of approaching it from an online, my class is online. Oh, and um, bonus, I'm going to offer it in person too. Great question. All right, so Laura, uh, I can see this working well with classes that require labs. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Giving them options, for sure. Uh, focusing on, okay, this is your mission. These are your milestones. These are your assignments to accomplish. How you, you know, I'm gonna put people in a particular cadence. Today you're in person, tomorrow you're online, you know, so on and so forth. I could see that being a win. I think it'd be motivating too. I think that could be motivating too for the students. It gives them, they feel like, wow, teachers care. This is cool. They're giving us some relief here. That's awesome. Okay, great questions. Keep them coming. I'm going to jump into talking specifically now in comparison, the high flex model. So as you might imagine, it really is just the combination of those four options with one differentiation, uh, which is instead of you determining who is online and who's in person, it is the student who gets to choose who's online, who's in person. The student gets to choose where and when, excuse me, where they participate in the class sessions. You op offer all options and they choose. Okay, that's a pretty radical concept. <laughs> I could see some stairs here to the Zoom. Uh, I get it. It is a. It is different. But like I said, yeah, I get some thumbs up, Lisa, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of a cool concept. Here's, here's why you, you might consider it. Um, and I, I hope that you all chime in on like Laura did and when and why it would be appropriate. But I would say that students, as we, as we get older, as we mature, what is the thing? There's two things that I think are safe to say about humans. Uh, our learning needs become more individualized, right? What I need when I was six uh, is, is different than I, it is today, which is 26. I'm not 26, for those of you not laughing. Uh, uh, I'm 29. So uh, the older we get, the more unique our learning needs become. What helps offset that is what? Autonomy, 
what do we all want in our jobs? What do we all want in our lives? We want the freedom to be able to make the decision that's best for us, right? I think that what we're seeing in the literature, and it's not really literature yet, it's more or less blog posts and, and reports and feelings and thoughts, opinion pieces at this point when it comes to high flex, that the evidence isn't streaming in just yet. Um, but I would say that the responses to people who have tried this in a real way is students will respond positively to you if you make this effort. They appreciate the effort. They will try to meet you in places in ways that you are not probably going to be used to. They feel like they're adults, right? We've heard that before. Many of us have said that before to our students. I'll treat you like the adults you are, right? You all have mortgages and families and stuff like that. Great. They, when that happens, maybe you can attest to that. They will meet you where you are. They will try to accommodate you. They love that ability to make decisions for themselves. Now, the drawback for you is that now you have to account for that. This goes back to what we were saying about the flexible uh, component where you don't know where, who's where and who's showing up to what. Um, that is a drawback. But I think it can help when it comes to changing learning outcomes, getting them to lean into it for sure. And here's another bonus part. And this is my, this is what sticks out to me in the reading uh, about who's doing this and what their reactions are. Um, I, I'm, I'm pulling at the threads to kind of come up with themes, accountability. All right. I hope that, I hope that really resonates with you right here, right now is because when a student makes a choice and it doesn't work out in their own favor, this will, will empower you, it will, it will help build in accountability. If it doesn't work or, you know, uh, hey, I don't learn well this way, I'm, a, I'm an auditory learner, right? Good luck with that conversation. In the meantime, all you have to say is, you made the choice, all offers were on the table. This was your decision, right? And what I'm wondering at this point, and I use that word wondering is, what is the impact of this over time, right? If they get through a program and maybe it's a year, maybe it's a semester, maybe it's all four, three, four years of their program, what type of professional will they, will they be at the end of that if they have to be accountable for their decisions as adults, as uh, 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 learners who own their own learning experience, right? The, the evidence is suggesting they're leaning into this. Students are, are doing things differently than they have before, but does this help build in accountability, right? I, I think it's in there in the CPAs. I think it's in there. I think it's in what we want to do as educators. I think we want our students to feel accountable. We know that that leads to better learning experiences, le better learning outcomes, and it builds a more employable uh, student perhaps. That's my opinion. That's my theory. But I wonder if that isn't motivation alone to try to, to, try to approach the high flex teaching model. Okay. And we had a we had a couple questions come in. Um, with the high flex teaching model, is the faculty member always on campus in a classroom? Not necessarily. Uh, I think that 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 um, the inverse of that, uh, and I love this question because that tells me somebody's thinking about this. Uh, no, I, and in most cases of places that are using this, in fact, there's a med school that's using this on the west coast and none of their faculty are in person for their lectures, the didactic components, their labs, they are streaming from class to class. So they might have a small group in one room and then there's another group, another couple rooms where there's small, uh, small class sizes and students get the choice, right? You, can't, you can only have 12 in a room, 15 in a room, come one, come all, first serve, first, you know, uh, uh, first ones, uh, first serve, right? In the room and then they get the choice. So if you wanna be in the room with the instructor, because you, you, you have a hard time hearing or you just want to see their face uh, behind the mask, uh, uh, what have you, then you get there early, get there early, and then it's on you. And you could even you know, work with them to try to figure those things out. But then conversely, if it's something that you don't need to be in there, maybe you have a, a, a lab assistant, maybe you don't have a lab assistant because it's not a lab, you don't have to be there. You stream this way and there's a classroom and the students show up in that classroom. You don't have to be there as an instructor. And there wasn't even an example of this where they did this for an instructor because they had health uh, medical conditions that, uh, that they were ex exposed 
And so instead of putting that instructor in a classroom full of a bunch of young folks, um, uh, they, they let, he was able to stay home and teach from afar and use this high flex model. Great question. What else we, we have, got? We have another question that says, um, to your knowledge, how long has the high flex model been around? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't check the dates. Um, I'll, I'll study that question and see if I can get back to you on that. I, I would say that um, the, the, the pandemic, when the stay at home orders, you know, arrived, I think that, that that's when, you know, maybe the smoke started. And then when it really became a, a thing, a rage, it was when people were saying, all right, we have to figure out a way to get back into campus. I think that's when superintendents and principals and and uh, you know, um, provosts and, and, and the like were making those type of decisions uh, from K-12 to higher ed to graduate, postgraduate even, people were starting to think about that. I personally had not heard of this uh, ever until the last six months and uh, was really keen to see if, if, is this a thing or is it really working? Um, and it sounds uh, by most accounts, the, digger, the, the deeper I dig, uh, people are buying into it. It's working so far. Yeah, if it's the COVID model, uh, you you know, you wonder. I like high flex better, uh, but yeah, it, you know, uh, there's probably a saying somewhere that one of you probably could come up with. But like uh, the, the mother of uh, uh, of all inventions, right? Finish the story uh, there. Like here we have a reason, and then people get creative and come up with a solution. And in five years from now, this might be all we're doing. Yeah, uh, yes, Monica is correct. Uh, I've seen a couple on the West Coast that are using the Hyflex model. All right, great. All right, just getting caught up here in the comments. All right, so I think you get it. Um, I think you get what the Hyflex model is. I'll just reiterate that ultimately it's it's kind of the best of all the, the, the four typical class models uh, for teaching. Um, with the exception that instead of the, the, the teacher dictating, the student dictates. The student gets the, and I hate to use that word, they don't dictate anything, they get the choice, they get a time. And there's reasons that you would, you would consider that. Um, students definitely, I think in my experience, when you, when you give them options, I, I've, I've, I've been surprised pleasantly every time, every time when I give them the choice. Would you rather write a paper or would you rather do this for your assignment? I bet, oh, doesn't matter, they love it. They absolutely love options, right? All right, so a um, couple questions, uh, actually a couple comments, a couple comments. So course design basics. So whether you're considering a high flex model or not, I, I, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't give you some options to think about when it comes to designing your own courses or uh, revising your own courses. Uh, right now, what is needed, as uh, I said a few slides back, flexibility. We need tools that help us in these uncertain changing times. It feels like every day, uh, almost, uh, almost every day, at least every week, circumstances are changing, right? And so how do you account, account for that level of fluidity? Here's some ideas. Number one, consider designing your course to be fully online first, right? Um, we can help you with that. We offer some resources. Of course, we offer some consultations through our website. You can come hang out with us. We'll help you walk through that. Uh, alternatively, we, we just wrapped up the Course Design Institute. We offered a couple sessions on that. We hope to offer that again in the near future where we walk through that with you. Um, think about designing your course online first and that the in-person in part is the bonus. All right, if you do that, you're gonna have most of your bases covered. In-person is different than online. For those of you who haven't done it, um, Talk to somebody who has taught consistently online. Uh, they'll have a lot to tell you. Um, if you cover the online part, the, the, the idea is that the in-person will automatically fall in, in place for you. It'll be less work. You do it the other way, you're gonna be doing a lot more extra work, okay? So be efficient with your time. Right now, whatever you do, it, you know, flexible, hybrid, high flex, whatever you do, design your course online first, okay? 
And then um, consider leveraging uh, uh, your LMS. You have Canvas here at, at this university. There's other things that are uh, out and about that you can use. Uh, Canvas, uh, we're, we're talking about adding capacity and features uh, to everything that's offered in the ATSU Canvas site. Uh, it's awesome. I, I love to be in this position. Uh, had a conversation uh, with the team today about uh, they're adding on Echo 360 and, and the ability to, to embed uh, uh, questions quiz capability. The new quiz uh, of Canvas itself is getting better by the day to account for this high flex model. Uh, believe it or not, use the, the, the tools that are, that are available to you, uh, uh, the resources. Uh, you're going to you're going to do do uh, it's going to do some of the work for you is what I'm saying there okay and then um, use synchronous time so now that your course is built with the assumption that your course is built how do I do this flexible meeting in person uh, not meeting in person regardless um, focus when you do have individual time with your students and I know this varies because some of you have uh, large blocks of time that you're with them. You have to cover 20 hours and two weeks of instruction. Um, that's okay. Pick out spots during that time to focus on regrouping, reconnecting during that time that you're all together. No matter if you're on person, if you're all online, or if you're a combination of the two. That time, at least every so often, should be to reset, recalibrate. Okay, we're all here. How are you feeling? What's going on? How can I help? That's going to go a long way for the learning process as opposed to just, hey, we're here. Let me just throw more information at you and they got to get through this as fast as I possibly can. Use that time to regroup, all right? Both from you to the student, the students together, and the students to you as well. All right. And then one of the things that is coming up in, in this review and, and studying in the different places that this stuff is coming up, Twitter and other, other strange places that people are sharing their ideas and their experience about using HyFlex or, or even just teaching in general since uh, the stay at home orders uh, it happened in the spring is the one thing that's clearly missing is the connection uh, this, to the students from the instructors, but also from each other, students really, um, and if you think about your own education, right, um, you probably can remember five of your instructor's names, but you could probably remember 50 of your classmates' names, right? So same thing, what can we do to help them still be able to have that same experience? What can we do? And so I'm gonna show you a couple of ideas, but you know, connect, encouraging them, Hey, yeah, do, do some stuff. Social distance, <laughs> social distance young people, but at the same time, is there a way that you can communicate and connect uh, uh, in your class, around your class to study, to do other things? Figure out ways to include that in your course. Okay, before I show you an example, any questions about this? Yes. All right. Here's an example. So again, uh, this is based on the high flex model um, and I'll explain where uh, to pay attention to make that clear to you. But I would argue that this um, again is a down and dirty way to think about what you're gonna do in class and what you're gonna do out, outside of class. Uh, there are, are, are other iterations of this model. Um, this model actually, I included the citation for shock value. It actually was invented in 2003 by a gentleman uh, who ran the teaching and learning center at a school in Florida. Uh, his name is Fink. He came up with this model to help people quickly design their courses and the activities from class period to class period. All right, so what you see here is for each unit of instruction, depending on your class, it could be one day, it could be one hour, it could be one semester. Whatever that case might be, you put the activity that you want to accomplish in that block. Right. And if you wanted to get topical and say, OK, we're going to talk about the knee, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, a molar, whatever it is that you want to talk about, you can include that. But for for uh, all intents and purposes here, I'm in, I'm just focusing on the activity itself that I'm going to use, uh, whether um, and it's built in a way to accommodate the high flex model where I'm going to have students in person and I'm going to have students online. OK, so I have in class. That means in person or online. I'm going to have a do a class-wide discussion for unit one where they have to talk 
as a group. So how do you do that? Kind of like what we're doing right now, we're using the chat feature. So even if you're in the classroom, pull out your digital device, whether it's your laptop, uh, mainframe, or a mobile, uh, mobile phone, smartphone, no matter what, pull out your device and let's uh, get on the chat and have a conversation, provide the prompting questions. If there's a reading to review, on any of those things, none of that changes, right? So have this classroom uh, discussion. And then you wanna create those connections, right? We, we, we all were in agreement. I love that we're all in agreement. We need to encourage students to connect outside of class in ways to simulate what they would do in class when uh, prior to the pandemic. So collaborative note taking. Has anyone tried this? Collaborative note taking? Anybody done this before? If you have, uh, uh, you know, feel free to raise your hand or to speak up and tell me what you think about it. Uh, hopefully it was good. <laughs> hopefully there's some good points that you can share with the group. But the idea here, Google, you, we have, we're a Google school, we have Google Docs, they have a reading, a link, everybody has it, read chapter two of the text or watch this video or re, you know, review this lecture that I provided in the Canvas course site, and now take notes and think, focus, focus on these things, um, where one person, you know, small group, one person in a Google Doc has to share it with the instructor for review, or, or just better yet, it's just a way to study. Right. This is what I want you to do in a Google Doc. You can all be in there at the same time. You can all be taking notes and then you can see each other's notes. That's the value. Ooh, I didn't think about that. Uh, Melanie, Melanie made a comment about what instructor, the instructor said about this idea. I didn't even think about that. Let me make sure that I highlight that. I need to bold that. So when I go to study for the exam that I'm aware of that. All right. So check out uh, collaborative uh, 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 note taking. And there's some other ideas here, you know, live polling, back channel, set up, set up a back channel. Is it Google chat? Is it, is it Twitter? Is it Canvas chat? Um, there's a lot of tools. Is it WhatsApp, right? We have, we have a lot of options out there for us and how students can communicate. Um, the really cool thing about Canvas is um, privacy is protected where you, you, students don't have access to each other necessarily directly. It's not a matter of selling, you know, giving each other phone numbers. Uh, necessarily, they can just log in and see a chat that's directed to them uh, that's connected to their email and their ATSU login credentials. Um, but uh, it's pretty it's pretty good too. And they could set the notifications up on their phone so they could see just like a text message if somebody uh, somebody communicated with them. Um, live polling, uh, hybrid pair, uh, think pair share. If you're not using it, it's one of my go-tos. Uh, put people uh, individually to think about something, pair them up. Pairing is subjective. It could be triads, dyads. It could be 10 people. It could be 30 people. Uh, um, we're going we're gonna to try that out in one of the future sessions for the TLC. But put them in think pair. They pair up and then share. They get to come back and summarize what it was that you talked about as a team. And then group work, that's pretty um, uh, ambiguous for reason because that means many different things to all of you. And then we have, uh, excuse me, we have uh, jigsaw, knowledge checks, fishbowl, where you might set people up in the classroom and then the online folks watch what's happening in the classroom, give comments, give uh, uh, constructive feedback, uh, valuation, something like that. That could be fun. I could see the fishbowl activity being really fun, something really fun for you. And then digital gallery walk. Uh, it's real popular in person. You put flip charts all over the room. You have people do stuff. You set up stations, kind of like an OSCE. But in this case, if they're online, uh, there's something that they have to review online and leave a comment. Again, you could use Google Slides, you could use Google, um, you could use all sorts of things uh, to, to allow people to do that. Okay, that's quite a bit I threw at you there. So this is an example of how you can execute the HyFlex model and how you can customize your class to work for a HyFlex model. But again, I think this works for anything that you would do in person, online, hybrid, flexible, or high flex. Any questions? Feel free to come up and mute. All right, I'm gonna power through here in just a few minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, Zoom polls is awesome. Padlet, yes, that's a great one. There it is, yes, absolutely, great suggestion. Love to learn more about that, how you're using that stuff. Uh, so final thoughts here before I wrap up and open it up uh, fully. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
honestly, what I really want to take away from this, now that you have a little bit of knowledge and it's very little uh, about high flex and how it might be used, how you might use it, I think this is an awesome opportunity to be innovative. We have a chance to do something that not everyone is doing. It's a differentiator for us potentially. And the learning potential is pretty dramatic. Um, there's a lot of signs and symptoms that tell us that if we do this, students might learn something in a new way that might help deepen that learning outcomes that we desire, right? So why wouldn't we consider ways to do that, right? We're all working feverishly to do it. You might as well get credit for it, is what I'm saying, right? Your students, you know, give them the option. Uh, of course, we don't want them to opt out of coming to class, but we want to give them the option to, to make a choice online, in person. Uh, they get to, to, to feel autonomy and they tend to take more accountability. They lean into it. They show up for you in ways that maybe in this time when we're all uh, um, spread a little bit thin, maybe they, they appreciate, hey, my instructor is trying to do something to accommodate me in ways that nobody else is. I hadn't seen before. It's novel. All those things. This is an opportunity to inform the world about how we can do things differently. It's an opportunity. Besides that, um, it solves a problem potentially with things being so uncertain. Uh, what happens tomorrow if your student gets sick? What happens tomorrow if you have somebody with uh, a medical condition? What happens tomorrow if uh, you need, uh, we have an, uh, 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 another order comes out, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm really putting all my positive thoughts that none of those things are on the table and that they happen. But are you prepared if that does? I argue the high flex model will at least put you in a position to, if you put the work in now, that when that does happen, you'll be more comfortable to handle any shift in what your needs are when it comes to teaching. All right. And then I'm going to say design your class to be uh, first uh, all online first. I mentioned that. I think that that takes some of this thing away. Um, if you, if you have that done well, the in-person thing will fall into place. If you do it the other way, in-person, and then try to offer it online, you're probably gonna run into trouble. I don't know that for sure, but that has been my experience. Online, you have to account for every detail. In person, there are things that come to mind that I'm like, oh yeah, and you can just look around the room and you can figure it out and you can offer that. And then lastly here, account for different ways that people learn. High flex model does that like nobody's business. That's one of the benefits of it. And what do I mean by that? Be centered, uh, learner, student centered, as opposed to uh, uh, put the focus of your uh, ambition on the student, on the learner, and what their needs are. For instance, when the student hands in an assignment, whether it's digitally or in person, ask them what kind of feedback do they like? What kind of feedback do you think resonates with you? Ask them that question and watch what happens, right? They're gonna tell you something. Again, back to accountability. And if I give them that feedback and it's not what they wanted or they didn't like it, guess what? You asked for it, I'm only delivering what you asked for. So um, I think that helps build trust, it helps build accountability, um, it helps put the focus on the student. And then uh, I'll say, you know, of course, leverage your resources. I wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be a TLC presentation if I didn't tell you what the TLC offers. We have a brand new shiny website. Please check it out, TLC uh, at atsu.edu. Uh, we have all sorts of resources out there for you. You can schedule a consultation. We can come talk to you. You can come talk to us. Uh, and we can talk about ways that you might implement any one of these things that is interesting to you. All right. We will be there that fits your schedule. All right, so questions, comments as we wrap up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. For those that have to drop, thank you. Thanks for being with us. We're gonna hang out here uh, to answer your questions for those of you who can. Thank you, thank you, I see the applause, I appreciate that. For those of you hanging around, thank you. Uh, for those of you hanging around, uh, I have a question for you. So what are the challenge for, what are the challenges would you say 
what are the challenges that exist to adapting and innovative teaching practices? Why is it so hard to spread innovative teaching practices, would you say? And you feel free to come off mute. It's a smaller group now. Moment. I'm in there. Oh, Corey, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, momentum is a challenge. I was just going to say, you know, us on the anatomy team, we're doing everything that we can to adjust to being online and just adjusting to different learning styles. But one challenge that we're running into is that no matter what, there's going to be something that people are going to complain about. So just trying to deal with that. I'll be candid with that. You're on mute, Quincy. Thank you. So you're saying you're saying the block is uh, complaints. So your worry, your your feeling is uh, being innovative creates extra complaints that you're like, nah, I don't want to. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we give the students a lot of ideas for how they can study and challenge each other as study groups, um, but then they'll kind of come back and say, hey, can you just um, list this all out in a table for me or can you just draw this out? Like we do a lot of that already. And so we're trying to provide examples for how we can get people to study effectively. And that just kind of, I mean, for the most part it works well, but then there's always students that just want more and want to be spoon fed. Uh, yeah, uh, I, t I get where you're coming from for sure. And, and you know, and my counter to that is again, what, 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 again, it's, uh, hey, thanks Corey. It's subjective at this point. Let me be completely transparent. Like the data is subjective, but people are saying like students will show up for you. They'll hang in there with you because they appreciate the effort, right? Uh, you know, somebody, you, you have a, a, a bad customer service experience. Uh, that's the only thing I could think of as an analogy, but if they, if they're trying to remedy the problem, right? You, you can't get mad. I mean, some people do, but it's hard to get mad at somebody and they're like, look, I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to take care of the bill. Uh, Okay, thank you for a great dining. I'll see you again, right? They'll, they'll, you'll hang in with them, um, uh, maybe, maybe. But I, I get it. People are around pretty tight, so you know that's something you have to to address yourself. Is like, how much can I take? How much can they take? I, I can't take too many complaints. Uh, you know, I'm not customer service today. Uh, I can't take too much more. I'll wait to the next go around, or I'll find a safer place to do it. But I, I, I get it. I think that you know. Um, it's, it might help. It, it still could help. This particular approach might still help. Thanks for sharing, Becky. I appreciate that. I also like was, what Neil oh, said. Uh, I was going to say, I also like what Neil said. The learning is in making the tables. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, who knew? Who, <laughs> Neil's speaking. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, it's like, it's like going to Mars and like learning is making the tables. And I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, this is what you're supposed to do. Can you make them for me? What? You, do I get your diploma too? I, I don't know. <laughs> I get it. I totally get it. That's crazy. Um, yeah, uh, Stephanie, knowing enough uh, to implement. Sure. Uh, th that's what we're here for you, Stephanie, for sure. And I, I hope you, you know that. Uh, you've hung out with us a couple of times. You're still here. You're still talking to us. Uh, so I assume that uh, you're not sick of us yet. But that is true. Uh, there are some details here. If I had more time, I'd go into more detail. But I just wanted to give you just enough to know a little bit about it so that you might consider it. But yeah, uh, for sure, there, you would, yeah, we'd be here to help. Great question, great point. Awesome, what else, uh, Neil? Uh, it, maybe people haven't answered this. Uh, we've done this case presentations where basically we have five students read through a case and then they, each one has a different case and then they'll present that case to their colleagues and to a grader, uh, one of the faculty members. The trouble is, is these cases have taken us years to develop so that, you know, they're, they're group proof, uh, but yet are clinically relevant. Um, and we went to virtualizing them. So we put them on the, and we use Zoom rooms to have them read the case and then a different room for them to present. Does anyone know of a way that they can, you can keep them from just copying those cases like by printing, pressing print square screen? Because it's so much work to have these, like 20 cases, uh, well, if we do this 10 times, so and we have 20 cases per, to not have to redo all our cases. Does anybody know a way to keep them from copying those when they're? 
Just a just a question. Jeremy, uh, Jeremy, uh, Dr. Hazard, I saw you come off of mute. Well, I'll, I'll uh, say something. Uh, Neil, your cases were already copied before COVID. <laughs> that, you know, that's what students do, right? They're the masters of shortcut. So all I was going to say relative to your question was what keeps me, because I've been doing uh, this model. We did a, a similar version of it back in 1999. Um, this is not, to me, isn't new. Uh, the, the thing of why is it challenging for me to take on innovative teaching strategies is because way too many of them have been uh, fads, you know, something that's just, um, you know, and, and Neil says it, you know, the, the magic is in making the table. There's a lot to be said about just some good tried and true, let's deliver some content, let's deliver it in a clean, concise, meaningful way, and the students have to grind a little bit and that table making is the grind and i i've every since i've been at K, kcom i've never taught the class the same way twice the, i mean the, the general infrastructure is always the same but there's always tweaks and you know going back to was it uh, uh becky's comment about you know student perceptions of some of these you know it's it's if you have a good positive relationship with them they're, they're, and, and they, they know they're in a, a testing phase, uh, they're, they're much more forgiving. Um, but at the same time, uh, they're also involved in that process. And to draw back on your account, accountability of the student is important. What I mean by that is, if I try something new and it, and it partially fails, their grade doesn't tank because of it. You know, and it's like, you know what, I'm going to take on some of the ownership of that. You're going to take on some of it because there's, it, it didn't fail just because the method was bad. It was also a, 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 a performance of the student. So you, you both kind of eat it a little bit. So those are just a few of my thoughts. But my biggest challenge is I'm not going to be quick to jump into something because I know the tried and true works for what I do. And it's going to take a lot to tell me to, to go away from that. So, you know, I, I, I can't gr agree more than, than uh, with, with the words you just said. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't need to do stuff uh, just to be doing it. Um, and Neil, I want to get back to your question too, but I, I appreciate, uh, Jeremy, you, you sharing that because good instruction is good instruction. Uh, if it's on a napkin, a bar napkin, or, you know, the largest side of the building, uh, a broad side of a barn, like it, it will work if it's, if it's, well designed and, and well connected, uh, and it, you just spoke like a battle-tested, uh, uh, brave educator, seasoned educator, uh, and how you approach that. Uh, there are a lot of fads out there. Um, I'm staying away from those things too. I try to I try to offer things that have some hint of evidence behind them, and, and at the same time that pose a solution to something that we're hearing a lot of. Um, maybe not totally relevant for what you're doing, Jeremy, and it sounds like you've tried it before, but I think that there's some folks that definitely would benefit from it if we could figure out a way to, to, to build momentum for them, allow them to come in and do that. But um, no, great, great, great point. Yeah, and don't take my comments as me bashing this. I was not I don't think so. that. I, I see I don't value think so. in, in what people do with these, these methods. No, I appreciate that sensitivity, but not. I didn't take it that way and, and return the sentiment. Um, Try, it, tried and true instruction is tried and true, right? Um, and if it works, it works. Uh, that's what I always say. Don't, that was the whole point of the lecture as a myth, right? Some people say, oh, it's the worst thing ever. You don't need to do uh, cartwheels uh, to, to show them a procedure, right? You don't need to do that all the time. Um, but no, uh, Neil, uh, so low tech uh, solution and you, you know, Chegg, I don't know if you've heard of Chegg, C-H-E-G-G, -G, uh, uh, so it, it's controversial, but basically uh, it's not a solution. You don't need a pen, I promise you, but it's, it's the solution of people stealing. Uh, it's created a community where if you have a math problem, you submit it to Chegg and it will solve the problem for you. It'll give you the answer, right? And now it, they've switched it to now it's like uh, uh, math departments are buying it <laughs> to grade. <laughs> because it's just that pervasive. If you can't beat them, join them. What I would, the low tech solution for you, Neil, is learning contracts. 
write up a contract and say, I will not steal this. Now, come on, Quincy, I know you're saying I, I'm not the last Boy Scout, I promise. But I think that it's shown to deter behavior. When people put their name to something and you're talking about medical professionals that are striving for a high standard, I think you can hold them accountable with something as simple as a PDF and say, hey, sign this. Like we, we, we have put it, to, I get it, I feel the pain. You spend so much time on those cases and then they're screenshotting it, um, which isn't fair. Uh, alternatively, there is some, a couple tech uh, solutions. I'm not sure, but we can talk to Dean in IT, uh, ITS and AT uh, about uh, Respondus. It will lock the browser down where they can't, they can't do stuff without you knowing. And then there's a third party software out there that will notify you when they take the screenshot. It's a, it's a third party. I'm sure it's some hack, some 15 year old built it, but it will, it will send you a signal and it will say, Oh, somebody just screenshotted what you're doing right now. So email me and we can, we can dig into this together. Otherwise you, you, Dean is not too far from you. Dean, Dean, Dean has a team on this. They, he could probably get you to answer faster. Yeah, yeah, that's true, cell phones. So that's why I said like best laid plans, you know, contract, maybe that will work and some smaller things. That's where Chegg's, Chegg came from. Chegg was, uh, uh, it's a phone app. It was taking pictures of the, of the formula. Uh, Neil. My, my uh, daughter was is a lawyer and she went to law school and uh, oftentimes we make fun of lawyers, uh, how they sort of are un underhanded and do kind of things. and they did do a learning con they did require them to sign a learning contract and um the students had to take home exams and they turned each other in if people were cheating wow. um and they were more honest about it than our med students seem to be so um i think uh maybe we'll try that learning contract uh, just good old-fashioned they made the law students in william and mary where she went to law school sign this contract that if they broke it they could be dismissed from school and and if if you didn't turn someone in that you knew was cheating, you were just as liable for dismissal from school. So I'll, I'll try it. Thank you. That's a great yeah. idea. In uh, Kelly Glazer, Dr. Glazer in Selma, she has a draft of a, of a learning contract. You might reach out to her and say, Quincy sent you. Oh, you know Kelly. What am I saying? You know Kelly. Reach out to Kelly and say, can I get a draft? Quincy sent me to you. I bet she can share it with you. Awesome. 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 Yeah. Honor code Vanderbilt. Do Yep. Yeah, at culture, absolutely, set in the culture. Uh, yeah, so, so thank you for humoring me with this question. Thank you for the extra time. Uh, I guess what I, I really wanna make the, the, the point uh, uh, kind of uh, tongue in cheek here, but I, I think we can do it. Uh, we just gotta wanna do it, right? We just gotta wanna do it. Um, we ha there'll always be challenges, kind of what Jeremy was saying, like there's always a reason, uh, you know, but if you need to do it, can we find a way to do it? TLC is here to explore that with you for sure. Um, otherwise, I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for taking this uh, time to hang out with us. We have some more sessions in October. We got a couple that will happen in October. We're looking forward to. Otherwise, I hope, I hope you have a great day. Thank you all for hanging out.